Uh, I got first a question for Nightfall. Was that you? I know you have like five accounts. Was that you on PL on Thursday against GPK's Tiny in the pub? Yeah, that's me. I just wanted to tell you <laughs> that that was the sickest PL I've ever played against, and I was wondering if you had any tips. Tips for you to play PL? Yeah, tips on PL. Like, you were the best PL I've ever played against, so I'm asking I you. I mean, I don't know if I can explain much. I think you just, if you just uh, want to learn, you can, like, watch some pro PL replays. So I should mean, I watch, watch that mines. replay, or so, do you have any uh, yeah. You can also watch yeah. Hitoro Team Spirit on PL. He's also he's, very he's, good. He's throwing. He just, uh, like, doesn't like Hitoro for some reason. Is, uh, he's uh, looking for <laughs> but, his uh, replays every day. If, if you want to learn, just, like, uh, can open some of my replays and, uh, like, watch out what I do and, like, uh, try to think why I'm doing this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a few moments later. Hello, everybody. Something I haven't done in a long time. I'm going to be reviewing a replay of somebody else I played against, actually. This may be something I've never done. So I did that replay review of the Earth Spirit in my lane who was on my team, talking about one of the best supports I've ever played with and all the things he did correctly. And I'm going to now watch for the first time this game. Uh, I am the centaur on the other team. And this is Nightfall on his, like, v v he's the carry player for Virtus Pro. He has, like, five accounts. They're all top 50 Europe. This is, like, his third or fourth Smurf account. And it's ranked 22. So his main account, he has two accounts in 11k MMR. Uh, needless to say, he's a incredibly good player. And the reason why I'm watching this replay is because... This is the best PL I have ever played against. Banana slam giant. So we're going to be talking about all the reasons why he's so good at PL and what he did this game through his perspective. Uh, I got to experience this from my perspective, and now we're going to watch it from his. Uh, to be honest with you, just to be clear, I, I see his name says all of you worst subhumans. I've played with Nightfall on my team four or five times. He's actually been incredibly pleasant to play with. I really like this guy's work ethic. Uh, I've become a new fan of Virtus Pro. All of the players are really not toxic in pubs, and they just try to take over the game in terms of uh, voice comms and everything. So uh, not only do I respect his game play, but I also enjoyed playing with him. So we're going to go ahead and check this out. So he's going to be a Phantom Lancer. He last picked. Uh, it's a pretty solid PL game. It's not a perfect PL game in the sense that we have a lot of area of effect spells. But it's a pretty good PL game if you watch my PL guide because we don't have any like long range gap close. We don't have uh, innate mobility on any of our heroes. So yes, we buy Blink Daggers on Ursa and Tiny. But we don't have the best way of finding the real PL. You're going to see that throughout the course of this game. So let's go ahead and check it out. Fast forward a bit. So at the rune, notice how he immediately dodges us and forces an engagement at the other rune. So there's an option to fight us here. And he realizes because of how many people he sees that he's just going to loop around. And he actually just walks past the phoenix because he sees the distraction going on over here. This is actually an insanely cool play that forces the phoenix to dive to pick up the rune. And so this is a situation where... At a high level, there's a lot of mind games that go on. Uh, Phoenix always wants to level fire spirits. Uh, both of Phoenix's other two abilities in lane are pretty useless early on. So he knows this. And he knows that if he does the play he just did, the Phoenix either chooses between not getting the bounty or leveling dive. So now all of a sudden, he set himself up for a better laning stage. So to be honest with you, I didn't even realize that my Phoenix leveled dive. Uh, it like happened and I saw it, but it didn't occur to me that for my own lane, I had a Phoenix without dive and that changes a lot of things. You know, level one, the first creep wave Phoenix with spirits could easily help me get a lot of CS. It allows me to be aggressive, uh, because if the PL ever tries to trade with me, the Phoenix can throw some fire spirits on him and then I'm going to get a few hits off, maybe get a centaur stomp and suddenly I get like a really good start. But now that he's forced out that dive, he's effectively made my support completely useless. And now you need to see what he does with this. I, as a centaur, think, oh, I outtrade PL. It's a good lane for me, all that kind of stuff. Now watch what happens the second I show because of the fact that he knows. He just starts hitting me. He just starts hitting me, lances me, zones me away from this creep. I don't exactly feel good about contesting it. Look at this. He doesn't even finish off the creep. He's just hitting me. He's literally just hitting me. And I'm a centaur. 
that is like, what the fuck just happened to me? This is like me just getting absolutely pwned. 500 HP, PL not an incredibly strong level 1 hero, acknowledges that my support is completely useless and effectively wins the lane, like, right there, to be honest. Like, that trade was so efficient for him that I then queued up flying a salve, and I suddenly don't even want to hit him at all because he's full HP and I'm half. So I have to use Stomp to hit him at all, and then he just gets the deny while I'm hitting him. I just remember feeling completely owned in this scenario. Just notice how many times he hits me, man. It's all these little moments that I can't trade with him because I'm either busy hitting a creep or I'm lower HP than he is. So this is another example where he sees my Phoenix as level 1, and he just got level 2 and Phantom Rushes me. And he knows that he's going to Phantom Rush me, which is free, no mana cost. And I, to make it, like, defend myself, I have to uh, use Stomp. So he's forcing out another trade, not just a health trade, but now a mana trade. And notice how a lot of this lane is about back and forth trading. So he doesn't go for boots, he doesn't finish the wand, he goes, he doesn't go for glove of haste, he goes for the item that gives him armor, attack speed, and damage, which is the band of elven skin component of the treads. So a little itemization goes a long way. Notice how he keeps forcing engagements on a low cooldown, utilizing the cooldowns of uh, AA as well as his phantom rush. And you can just see all the efficient trades they're taking. This felt really hard to lane against. Like, I'm super low. He's been super healthy this entire lane. It's like, yes, he's level 3, or level 2, and I'm level 3. That's But that's because, look at the CS, right? He's ahead by 3 CS. And I'll be clear, PL's supposed to lose this lane. Like, Centaur's definitely a stronger laner early levels than PL. So the fact that he's, like, winning it all is impressive, to say the least. So, I'm going to keep fast-forwarding. He's, tr he's done a really good job of keeping the lane equilibrium outside of his tower, but as close to his tower as possible. Notice how he once again abuses that low cooldown of the Phantom Rush between CS. Doesn't miss any CS of his own, just gets like a quick efficient bonus 20 agility hit off. And then they catch me out. That was probably just a bad play on my part, to be honest. But he had no regen, so it's really not a terrible death for him. He doesn't love it, but since I died first, uh, the core-to-core -core matchup goes in his favor pretty heavily. So I'd say that's still good for them, but obviously not ideal. That was him capitalizing on me going for a deny when I was pretty low. Okay, so my Phoenix here being a little papeg, I'm not gonna lie. So he sees that my Phoenix rotated bottom, and he immediately starts pushing top. He's got a level advantage on me, and he also knows that I'm alone. So notice how he lances me, he phantom rushes me, he's getting me weak, and then he also intends to pressure the tower with the catapult. So this whole play he just did there wouldn't have worked if he didn't do it the first time. So it's just a war of attrition here. He actually forces a reaction back to his lane from the Phoenix, because he sees what's happening to the tower. And now the Phoenix is like getting a little crazy. Another efficient trade for them. This was like almost like fake pressure on the tower because he's not level 6 yet on PL. He can't like summon illusions that tank uh, for the creep wave. But because he put so much pressure on me, he did force my PL to come back. Or my Phoenix to come back. So notice how because my fa my Phoenix came back, he actually went and farmed the jungle camp rather than looking to pressure the tower. So he forced a reaction back. Then he stopped pressuring the tower, and now he's going for the early hood. Notice how I went for the double-edge build, so he's like, okay, I'm having some sustain issues. I'm against a lot of mid-game uh, magic damage. The tiny, the phoenix, the centaur. So he goes for the sustain item that allows him to continuously occupy the map. So now what happens here is he saw a tiny running to his lane. Uh, so we're going to pause for a second. He, run, he sees a tiny running to his lane, and he sees that Ursa died. So this is a... a Serious opportunity that a lot of carry players that are not this caliber miss out on where by being top He's a liability because if he wants to stay in this lane, he's like getting ganked by a level 9 tiny with blink and uh, That means he needs help like his team would need to rotate to him to help him here so instead of being a liability and like waiting for assistance he immediately recognizes this scenario and of TP's bottom to a lane where by instead of forcing his team to react to him uh, to help him, he's now forcing a movement that because it's him and uh, Venno in the same lane, uh, it's going to force us to react to him if we want to defend this tower. And it's a pretty scary lane for us to TP into. 
So it's just a really cool like map pressure move. And a lot of times when we talk about pressure, it's due with like what team is forcing the other one to react to who. So it looks like we opt to take the trade. Starts cutting the creep wave, summoning his illusions. And gets a tower on PL nine minutes in. That's pretty huge. We talked about in the PL guide that this is usually where you end up as a PL. Sometime between 8 to 12 minutes. So he opted for the Blink Dagger on Tiny to be the reason why he left top. So he's going to take this time to ramp up his own farm. By doing the classic carry rotation around the bottom half of the map. And just remember that he has a hood, so I'd expect him to participate a little bit in the game if uh, it, it calls for it. So this is an example of what I mean. Uh, I don't remember exactly what happened in this game, but notice how he is willing to show up to an engagement. He sees that I'm pressuring mid. So it's a cool part about Dota. Is understanding how much impact you can have in fights. So he built an item that allows him to impact the game. So it's a combination of a few things. One... Does he need to impact the game? Like, if he removes himself from the equation, if he's just farming jungle creeps all game, what happens? And if you look at our lineup, it's pretty high tempo. And uh, he's designated, he's like declared that he needs to be active in this game. So if you look at the heroes on each team who would pressure towers, because that's almost always going to tell you who, uh, where stuff's going to happen. If you look at the, who pressures towers on both teams, you have Venomancer on Dire. He's the guy that sits in the lane pressuring the tower. And you have Centaur on Radiant, the guy that buys the Vanguard in the hood and walks out of lane, right? So he sees that. So notice how his farming pattern went from here to here. And instead of going back bottom, it went to here. Which means that he can then participate in the fight that was going on mid. And just overall contribute to the pressure that's going on in this lane, right? We're talking about pressure a lot. This is high-level stuff, but it's stuff you can learn from. It's like, oh, they're trying to pressure this. I'm trying to pressure this. It's like a reverse tug-of-war. Instead of pulling, we're both pushing really hard. And so he thinks he can contribute to this because he went this Hood of Defiance. So it d dictates his farming uh, rotations a little bit. It felt like he was constantly a presence on the map. And as a Phantom Lancer, that's pretty hard to achieve. So it was pretty annoying. So you can tell that there's kind of like this uh, tension going on in the mid lane. And he's purposely keeping himself somewhat close. Without griefing his own farm. You see this, right? He's still hitting jungle creeps. But it's all about the jungle creeps he chooses to hit. So notice how he's going to farm his way back towards mid. Doesn't choose to like go top or anything. Fast forward. Normal farming patterns. So notice how he hasn't shown up to mid again. Because nothing was happening for a while. He's not going to like gimp his own game and make sure he doesn't have one. But notice how something happens again. Here he is. He forced this fight. As a PL with no items. He forced this fight. He's going to single handedly kill the egg. Made us go on him. Like if you're our, if you're our team right now right. What would you do. If you're four heroes here. And you just have, you just killed two heroes, and a PL runs into you like this. What would you do? Like, look at what we do. What, what, what would you do here? My, st my stomp was on cooldown, so I didn't get him. But he forces an engagement that he knows he can't be brought down. His puck was respawning. His clockwork can capitalize on anyone that goes on him. And suddenly, they just get a three-man wipe when he's a PL with no items. Like, he just has a hood and two blades of alacrity. So, the insane awareness to go on us when two of his teammates are dead, knowing that Centaur Stampede was used. He might have even known that my Stomp was on cooldown. I don't know. But that, was, to me, was like an insane play, but super effective. Notice how he jumps into the fight and immediately ignores the tanky cores and goes for the backline supports now that he has a defusal. So he doubles in because we don't have the best way of distinguishing the real one. We kind of talked about that. And he doubles in and immediately goes for the Oracle in the back. No hesitation. Phoenix has no egg. So out of the two backline supports, Oracle's the best to go for. Pops his hood. Super tanky. Resets the fight. He's maxed out Doppel at this point. Notice how he skipped the skill point at level 10 to make sure he can max his Doppel. Kiting us really well, utilizing Phantom Rush to ex extend the gap. And after all this, he's just creating so much impact in the game as a freaking PL. 
And I'm just like, holy crap. Like, I was playing against this, and I'm like, this guy is literally dictating everything our team is doing. Notice how he's back in action. I think this is simply a recognition that his hero is stronger than Ursa. Ursa went for the Battle Fury, and he went for the Diffusal. Uh, honestly, he gets bursted there. I think we did a really good job of bursting him. Uh, so it's like a slight misplay on his part. I'm not gonna, like, sugarcoat it. It is a slight misplay. He got comboed by Tiny and stomped by me and then, uh, hit four times by Ursa. But I think that's the idea of what he's doing. I would say that's pretty much one of the few mistakes he made this entire game. So, runs it back. No hesitation. Forced out Egg. Forced out Ursa Ultimate, even. Now we use Stampede to try to disengage. And suddenly... After forcing this engagement prior, his solution is not, oh, I died, go back, you know, let's retreat to farming a bit. His solution is, I died, I made them use long cooldowns, let's go again. My hero does not have cooldowns. So, even though it could be considered a mistake that he, like, did what he did at our jungle, because he forced out long cooldowns, then won the fight afterwards, if you look at, like, the map control here, he's consistently been farming between fights. So he hasn't been, like, losing out on space on the map. This is another classic juke right here. So let's actually slow this down. So he gets gone on by Tiny. Doppels. Rushes back in and immediately micros the illusion away. Like, that was just confusing. We realized which one was him because of the lance. Bought him enough time to um, create some space. His team's, like, collapsing, so he's kind of waiting. Notice how his team on the minimap's coming in. There were just so many times this game that he put himself in just enough danger that we went on him, and then we didn't kill him. Have you noticed that, how often this has happened? It's even as simple as the fact that he was farming this hard camp, and instead of farming over here, he was farming over here. It seems like such a small thing, but every time he's, like, deciding his little movements, he, like, barely lives, and it's just really cool. So what I've seen a lot of players do that I've been working on myself is that he hits this defusal timing, and then you have to kind of realize that after the defusal, you don't get much stronger until you hit your next item, right? So even though he still has the same item and he's like the same power level, it's been three or four minutes now. So notice how he hit that defusal timing and he forced like four engagements in a row. And then now that it's been like a few minutes since he got this, he's like not forcing anything. He's just chilling because he realizes that we've all gotten on the Radiant side another three or four minutes worth of items. And now, like, Diffusal Hood may not be enough to actually be super strong. So now, instead of going into fights first, he's going to be the guy that shows up to fights last. So he's kind of, like, adjusted his approach to fighting based on his own power level. On PL, we always talked about never overcommitting. So notice how he tried to show up to the fight, but he never really went in. He just sent some illusions in, got some mana burn. Acknowledges that we're going to take Roche, but he's actually scouting it out since they're respawning and we're a little bit scared. I think my Ursa should have taken Roche there. Uh, for whatever reason, he just didn't want to. It was very strange. So I think SNY would have been reasonable for him here. Uh, I think Manta is either just a personal preference or he thinks he needed it to clear waves. I, I would have to ask him personally why he built Manta, but it just doesn't exactly dispel much here. There's no roots or anything from our team other than Oracle, which isn't really going to hit him. Yeah, notice how he's taking a chill pill for the last five minutes or so. Just playing his own side of the map. Bottom lane got pushed out when he needed to do it. Otherwise, there's really no lanes to deal with. So he's just been playing chill. Similar to like an anti-mage style. Not really trying to fight. Making sure he's ready if a tower gets pushed or anything. Notice how he's always around mid and bottom. Scouted out the Roche, but we got it. Didn't try to force him to contest. I want to emphasize that the way he's been playing, we just never see him. We're never ganking him because we just don't see him. We don't know where he is. Notice how he's kind of been consistently moving back and forth between the own two jungles. Sending out illusions at the creep wave. We don't. We hardly ever see the real PL. Like He never shows on the map here. So we're trying to force a fight. His positioning is on the high ground. He has a ward. Let's see what he does in this fight, actually. His fight... Contribution was crazy. So he immediately wraps around the back, forcing the Oracle away again. Oracle, who wants to be saving teammates, is just a fucking liability, to be honest. Ends up dying. Re-engages after killing the saving support. 
Yeah, his target priority in fights was just crazy. We were the ones that initiated this, and he just jumped our Oracle right through us, to be honest. that's He lets the Tiny go in, and then immediately goes to the Oracle. And ends up playing a really long, drawn-out, hided fight. And notice how he never really went in, other than the Oracle. He went on Centaur, me briefly, and then doppled immediately away from the Ursa. He built the Shard, because that synergizes with this playstyle. So suddenly this game's kind of blown wide open for them. We we had a pretty significant map control there. We had Aegis. We were up by two or three thousand net worth. And I just want to point out that he's always near his team when they do stuff. The number one point of contention, 20 minutes plus, is always mid lane. And notice how his farming patterns, since he knows he's strong enough, are like right here. Just right here. Every time something happens mid, he's there. I think it's very easy as a carry to see yourself farming bottom, your team feeding mid, and just being like, why are they feeding? Stop feeding. While if you look at the way he's been playing, he's consistently available to the team. He's not making anything happen, but he's there whenever something does happen. Immediately jumps the Oracle again. Jumps the Phoenix now. Resets the second he forces out Egg. Looks to re-engage since his puck bot back, but he's just going to back now because he realizes probably nothing's going to come of it. His target priority has been insanely good. Killing the Oracle, defending the Oracle, to, or for, forcing the Oracle to use ult on himself, and then going on the Phoenix, using ult to defend himself and backing off. Notice how he waited to Doppel until the egg came out so that he could disengage the fight because he knew, like, this is when I'm going to disengage is right when the egg comes out, and that's what Doppelganger is used for. Okay. I want to point out that he has three illusions hitting the tiny, and his manta illusions are chasing the phoenix out of the fight. Let's just be very clear. So, he's kiting us while burning the tiny's mana and zoning the phoenix. Well, let's just point that out. Dopples himself to a high ground, playing around his own vision. Notice how he's just wearing and tearing us down. With the Venomancer, with the AA Ag Shard. He's never committing. He's just constantly forcing out BKBs, forcing us to defend ourselves with spells. Notice how he goes on us. So we go on him, and then he immediately walks away because we have a very heavy commitment lineup. He makes the Phoenix Egg again, backs off immediately. Look at the Poke and Prod. This is like my entire guide on PL talks about how PL needs to never commit until it's the absolute right time. And he never commits, but yet everything he's doing is just enough to force us to react to him. So it's forcing a fight. It's forcing us to use spells. We have cooldowns. He does not. So eventually this... Is this fight what? Like four minutes long? Like how long was this freaking fight? And he's still just alive. So arguably his team did die and it looks like not the best result. But I'd say he played that fight as about as well as he possibly could have. So he's constantly scouting Roche. He's not actually going in and stopping us, but he's constantly scouting it with illusions and then lancing us away. So it's like the objective on the map right now is Roche. We have an Ursa. It's respawned. Second Roche in this current patch is really important because the Ag Shard, the Cheese, and the Aegis. So notice how he's not leaving this area. Just constantly forcing the fight in this area. Migrating his tanky illusion to go cancel the tiny blink. Notice how he's always fighting around cliffs. So he has the option to like dobble up and down cliffs. He lances me while going on the tiny to make sure I can't blink in. I literally couldn't blink ever this game. I force staffed him to save my teammate, and then he sees that I have no force staff, so he immediately goes on me. Scouting with an illusion while he's finishing Roche. Now he's in control. He's got the Aegis. He's going for the Octarine build. Hey, if you see the way he's playing, it makes sense, right? It gives you more range on your, your Lance. It gives you more range on your Doppelganger. Lower cooldown on your Lance as well. And lower cooldown on your Doppelganger. So now he... Look at how he was... He took mid while we were dead. 
He took mid tower while we were dead. And then look at bottom lane getting pressured. He's sending illusions to scout for heroes. He's actually burning a lot of Phoenix's mana while taking the tower. And then he's sending illusions to kill mid wave while waiting for his team to clear bottom. And notice how he's sitting in between the two lanes. He's sending illusions continuously to cut mid. This is something that I've critiqued a lot of like my 4K, 5K students is that you guys would finish this tower and then immediately go to this tower because it's like the obvious play, right? You want this objective. But in the meantime, while one of your teammates has taken the 45 seconds or whatever, push this lane to here, he's consistently pressuring the lane that is adjacent to the one that you're pushing. So this is a really important step that a lot of you skip. So really take note of this specific moment. It's really important for map pressure, what he's doing here. And he laps around, ready to secure the tower, but we get, he gets it, so no big deal there. Doing the classic PL thing, sieging high ground, constantly lancing us, disengaging any time an actual spell comes out. So in this case, Sunray waits for his doppelganger cooldown. And so now we're going to do the map control move that is mirrored on the other side if you're Radiant. And it's once you have Aegis, it's once you've taken all the Tier 2s, it's Occupy the Triangle, people. So now that we've taken all the towers bottom, there's absolutely no reason to play there. They also have two wards that see anybody on our team that tries to go bottom. So since they have wards bottom, if they are to cut mid wave and top wave, we have no play. Like, look at our map, right? Where do we go? If this wave is cut, this wave is cut, and this area is warded, where do we go? Absolutely nowhere, right? So he's going to make the... He's going to be a part of this with his team. Immediately jumping the supports again. Like, look at his fight targeting, right? The egg goes off. He now engages onto us since the ults have been used. Honestly, allows us to kill him there, it almost looked like. Uses his Aegis very effectively. The Ursa used his entire BKB overpower charges in order to kill the PL. And then dies immediately after. A lot of little microing of his illusions if you see. Like, I'm pretty lazy about this, I would say. Notice how he actually, like, usually what you do with your regular hero. This is, like, a really small one, but it's just so... He's so good at acting. So... I'll just tell you that it looks like I'm like, you know, S and his D about something that's pretty minor. But throughout the entire course of the game, it was really hard to tell which one was real. It was like really hard. So if you watch a lot of high level players when they're sieging tier three towers, their hero will auto attack, move, auto attack, move, auto attack, move. And then he just does that with his illusion. <laughs> you see that? It seems so small, but it was so hard to tell which one was him all the time. These little micro movements were so cool. Doppels to give himself vision, chasing to cancel the blink of the tiny while he's sieging. The game's not over yet. The game goes for a little while. I'm going to fast forward. While we're all dead, gets two lanes of racks, cleans up the last tier two, gets every objective imaginable. And now at this point, he has all the sustain in the world for long drawn out fights. Notice how he envisions the fights, constant poking, constant long engagement where he's burning mana, forcing out cooldowns and spells while he has none of them. And so he has all the regen, the sustain that he needs. So now his item is Scotty, which bulks him up a little bit, but mainly it reduces our regen. So not only is he more sustainable, but now we are less sustainable. So his vision of the fight matches his items very well. And this is just waiting for Roche is what they're doing here. Just the long, drawn-out wait for Roche. Consistently controlled top and mid. He's playing with his team the whole time. Bought his item. Now that top wave... Or now that he sees somebody bought him, excuse me, they immediately cut here to try to hunt us. He saw the Ursa. But he's like, okay, back to clearing mid. Notice how long he gave himself to hunt. He's like, okay, net before mid wave gets there, I'm going to hunt. And then he sees one of our teammates go for mid wave. Me and the tiny. Immediately collapses on us. Spells used again. Disengages the egg. Every time. I got saved by the egg there. So he doubles in and immediately goes on the Phoenix. He has cheese. I'm 
I'm like watching this as slowly as possible. You're seeing the range on the doppelganger pay off a lot. So see somebody else in the fight. Notice how he's been distracting literally four heroes this entire time. I was honestly just out of position there like an idiot. He's never allowing us to bunch up. Do you notice that? He's literally toying with his food here. Back to what he was doing prior. Clears out the triangle, but his entire team is dead. So instead of occupying the triangle, he backs off. Really cool, like, farming, robbing mechanic, or robbing move here. He still knows Roche is the only objective. He's just stalling for his team, but he actually die, bites the dust here. Immediately buys back. This is just like one of those fights that decides the game. If we just walk away with that Roche and get away with it, he might just lose. So notice how even though he kind of died at the Roche pit, he was perfectly fine to use his buyback here. I'd almost argue, based on my experience in EU so far, that players like this purposely are okay with dying, knowing they have buyback, and then forcing a fight afterwards. I've seen it countless times. So, didn't really work out for them all that well, but I do believe this was intentional. It's not that he goes into the Roche pit wanting to die, but he goes into the Roche pit knowing this fight matters a lot, and he has buyback, so if he dies, he can proceed to force a fight after he dies, which is exactly what he did. So it's like, it looked good for us. They lost net worth, but we're the ones losing racks. What? You know what I mean? Like, how did that happen? And I, I actually believe it was just like a game-winning understanding of buybacking that a lot of these high-level carry players and uh, honestly most players in EU have. I, don't, I think it's a big difference in knowledge gap between NA and EU is use of buyback from the general population of players. So what I really learned from this game, because um, they do end up winning, is that he understood that his hero was consistently useful in the early game after buying the hood, and he consistently placed himself near mid. Uh, he never farmed bottom and then had to TP mid. I think I would have prioritized farming bottom a bit more, but he legit farmed his own side of the map, knowing that he could show up to any engagement that happened mid, and he consistently showed up there. Uh, and it was impactful, too. That one fight that he forced us to go on him, and then we lost three heroes, that was, like, a huge momentum loss in the game for our team. Uh, you may say, like, PL, he's the king of the late game. Like, of course, at 48 minutes of the game, he won. It's like, that's like the... You know, I'm 2K, don't understand all the things this guy did to get here. There's a lot of little things he did to shut us down, to slow us down. Um, his overall approach to fights, his targeting was really good. He targeted the supports. He always made the Oracle defend himself rather than his teammate. And he always made the egg come out from the Phoenix and then he immediately got disengaged. Uh, there was only like once or twice that he actually hit the egg. And that was when the Phoenix was entirely alone um that he did that so he didn't like he had like a very specific idea of when he would kill the egg and not just you know choosing one way or the other uh and then all his like overall fighting he like constantly sent illusions at me and the tiny the centaur and the tiny uh to cancel our blinks because he knew that we were like the source of catching him the stun that would potentially lock him down long enough to get the ursa on top of him and then all these things are all about him playing around his double cooldown such that we would be forced to do something about whatever he's doing. Like, he'd be threatening our support. He'd be burning my mana. I have to stomp to defend myself. And then he would immediately doppel and run at us again. And that's what it's all about with low cooldown heroes. Like Phantom Lancer, like Anti-Mage, like Slark. It's all about this, like, super long, drawn-out patience that you are forcing the opponent to defend themselves because you are offering enough of a threat that they can't ignore you, but then running at them the second they use their spells. And I just think that the way he did little things, even with the Lucian Micro, is really cool to watch. It was just clean. Like, he had one death in the laning stage. He had the one death here where he got bursted. And I would argue the death at the Roche Pit was calculated. I would actually argue that this one is calculated. So, really... 
uh, when I talk about this one being calculated, it's just the end result. It's like he dies, he buys back, we get Roche, and then we lose, get Megan. <laughs> like, I would consider that calculated. If he dies, buys back, and they get map control. Uh, yeah, it's just really cool. I hope you guys enjoyed this little replay review. I don't do this very often, but I'm trying to make sure anytime I have, like, a very positive experience playing with or against somebody that I'm going to upload them. So, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please like, comment, subscribe to the YouTube channel, all that shenanigans, because at the end of the day, YouTube does care about that. You may not care about it, I may not care about it, but the YouTube algorithm does, so please do.